Where's my jetpack? The technology we were promised to kiss. What we got. And what's coming next. Here is Michael Haynesworth. MGM presents Westworld. Since Westworld premiered in 1973, and then we got that 2016 reboot. Just don't forget, they're not real. And all the silly spoofs in between. Yeah, baby! <laughs> we've been promised a world where our most intimate fantasies can be played out through the safety of a partner that won't reject our weirdo interests. Sex bots are still coming. And to a small degree, they're already here. There's already a company that makes the bodies and is experimenting with animating them. Another, perhaps recognizing that the greatest sexual organ we have is our brain, has been working on making them conversational. So let's see, let's see if she can replace me. Let's see if Bear Claw here can make you guys laugh. All right, uh, Bear Claw, tell us a joke. Why did the robot cross the road? Why? To kill all the humans. These developments have led to some serious questions about whether we really want a world of consequence-free sex. As Amber Healy writes at wheresmyjetpack.ca, when the partner isn't a person, but a very real looking doll, is anything taboo? Meet Annette Masterson. She's a PhD student at Temple University, and she spent the last few years researching the state of sex bots, how we got here, where we are, and what's coming next. Coming up, We'll find out the answers to those questions and more. But first, by now you've probably heard of the metaverse, or at the very least that Mark Zuckerberg renamed Facebook to Meta to distract us from how he's destroying Western civilization. It's basically the third generation internet, a virtual world in which we'll all soon live thanks to VR headsets and AR glasses. But the metaverse isn't new. Version 1.0 was launched in 2003, and if you're a fan of The Office, you know it still exists today. It's called Second Life. Founder Philip Rosedale tells me he's not convinced that Metaverse 2.0 is going to be a thing until we overcome some of the big science and social problems. 20 years ago, though, he believed we'd all spend some of our lives as avatars and some of our lives as real people. But Second Life peaked at 1 million users back in 2009 and hasn't really budged since. He now believes it's because most of us have the ability to invest in one primary avatar, one identity, one physical body. Today's metaverse creators, they simply don't get that. The metaverse is going to be a lot like the World Wide Web. Lots of metaverses, just like we have lots of websites. Some will be social, and some will be corporate. Let's just stop and think about that for a moment. That meeting that could have been an email, that's a Zoom call today. And soon that Zoom call that could have been an email, that's going to be a VR meeting in the metaverse. The social problem that science needs to solve is replicating body language. Next generation VR headsets now have cameras facing inward to capture eye movements and facial expressions, but Rosedale says that's only part of the solution. You know how you can tell a friend has walked into a room even if you don't see their face? It's the way they carry themselves, the way they walk, the way they move their bodies. We're constantly giving off nonverbal cues other than using our face. Mr. Second Life tells me that until we can identify an avatar this way, adoption of the metaverse will stagnate, just like how Second Life today can't get past more than a million users of the five billion people on the internet right now. And that's even without those fancy VR headsets or AR glasses. To be comfortable, for more than 30 minutes at a time, a headset needs to go from 500 grams today to about 200 grams, the weight of a pair of ski goggles. 5G will offload a lot of that computing weight to the cloud. But in the meantime, that Zoom meeting that could have been an email isn't going away anytime soon, no matter how quickly the metaverse arrives. Most technological revolutions aren't the result of a single advance, but a coming together of disparate technologies. We wouldn't have the smartphone today without pinch to zoom, high-speed wireless, and advances in the glass that turns them into glowing rectangles. The same can be said for sex bots. A combination of new rubbers, lightweight materials, and artificial intelligence means sex bots, the ones we were promised, are still on their way. Sex bots may evoke a giggle today, and that's something Temple University's Annette Masterson has had to deal with since she started her research into society's obsession with replacing human companions with robots. Insert clip here. Her investigation into the history of sex bots and where the technology stands today reveals sex bots are still in our future, but they aren't going to be just high-tech masturbation devices. 
Companies like Boston Dynamics are setting the stage for mobility, and a countless number of researchers are paving the way for them to become interactive companions. I began our conversation by asking her what led her to research the state of sex bots and their societal implications. I think it's uh, it's something that I've often thought about when I have picked up this topic and I've been talking with others about sex robots and how they're developing and what their future could look like. Um, in 2018 or so, I found a video about the real doll uh, Harmony model uh, that was uh, kind of released at that time and now has become one of the leading uh, sex robot producers in the world. And I just found the creation of them very interesting. I found the way that we were discussing them really interesting. And I think it has not just implications for you know, human machine communication, but also how we just talk about sexuality and sexual pleasure in general. And I think that that has a really interesting way uh, to kind of think about our society as at large, really. So when you went to Temple University and said, I want to do this research, what was the reaction? Uh, it was a little surprised because my application didn't specify <laughs> sex robots. So I think that there was a little bit of uh, what, you know, as you said, what led you to this uh, kind of direction. Um, but I think that overall, Temple and also just academia in large is really understanding that sex robots as a product, but also sex technology in general, is really uh, something of the future and something that we need to really be talking about now, not just because it talks about, you know, Se uh, sexuality and social implications, but also there's a lot of technological components um, that are going to have real implications when it comes to artificial intelligence and such. So there's been a lot of positive, uh, you know, response with that. And then also, I think the field in general, there's a huge growing of scholarship. So overall positive. <laughs> you focused on companionship, creation, and sentience? Yeah. So in the uh, paper that I did, a, a research analysis that I did on the Real Doll CEO, Matt McMullen, uh, and his discourse, how he talks about himself, his company, uh, his model Harmony, and the ones that have subsequently been released, it's really the three themes that came up most commonly were how are we creating them, uh, gender issues within that, and then you've also got potential sentience, you've got potential uh, for even rights and things along those lines. So those uh, components really come up quite often when he is talking about his own product and his company. Uh, and I think that that it has potential generalizability when it comes to uh, how sex robots in general could be uh, discussed in the future. Um, and it also really says a lot about how he is going to be creating this product. And as a leader in the field, uh, his word has a lot of value. Humanity's interest in sex bots goes back hundreds of years. Sailors in the 1880s reputedly had them, but mostly as a means of keeping the crew from testosterone-fueled fights on long journeys, not as companions. In his book, Sex Dolls at Sea, Imagined Histories of Sexual Technologies, Dr. Bo Ruberg of the University of California, Irvine, says that Despite the narrative, it's really not as accurate as we might think. The so-called dames de voyage were apparently made of cloth, but in reality, by the mid-1800s, vulcanized rubber was a new breakthrough. And Masterson says, that's when you actually see the first real sex dolls. That's kind of what we're seeing as potentially the narrative or the true beginnings of sex doll, uh, but some you know potential research is needed for uh, understanding where the Dames de Voyage came from, but it's a really interesting book that she just put out about how we're unpacking and talking about sex dolls uh, and their, their history, which obviously has led to sex robots now. It's interesting that the development of a certain type of rubber was used to advance a sexual object. You know, we often talk about how advances, technologically speaking, often end up having sex uses initially. You know, the VCR, widely considered to be one of the best examples of that. But you're taking us all the way back to the 1800s. 
Oh, yeah. And I think there's a lot of uh, intertwined with the sex industry and then just, you know, more corporate standard products that we see, you know, as you said, the VHS uh, is a very popular example. Even, you know, now when we see robotics, are we going to see these robotic components being utilized in other capacities? Are these companies going to expand into, you know, the technology industry? And I think that often that history of, you know, sex technology with, you know, more standard products is sometimes hidden But in fact, there's a lot of intertwined uh, histories and current times uh, that are very interesting and have a lot of really uh, interesting implications as well. The first recorded blow-up doll appeared in a psychiatric book published in 1908, but it didn't really seem to catch on until the late 1960s. Were, Were people taking them seriously or was this more of a stag night gag kind of thing? Yeah, it's the blow up doll. Obviously, you 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 know see the image of the blow up doll. It looks a bit uh, more like uh, something that you would see maybe as a gag, not necessarily utilized for uh, its own you know truly connective purpose of sexual pleasure, emotional connection with that. Um, but it's hard to say how they were utilized. How you know blow up dolls are still. Uh, available, how they continue to be utilized, because a lot of the times people weren't talking to people who were using these. How are you using them? Are you emotionally, uh, you know, connected to your uh, blow-up doll? But there is a huge influx in the 1960s where all of a sudden, you know, this comes onto the scene. It becomes a really popular thing in, you know, discourse, in the public to talk about. Um, And I think that nowadays, in present time, you, you look back to 1960s and the blow-up dolls, especially with the sophisticated, uh, more hyper-realistic uh, sex dolls that you see on the market now, and they do seem a little uh, benign in that way, in that they don't have the capabilities and the visuals that we see now. But it is a really interesting history how that kind of led to a bit more discourse and potentially maybe more comfort when it comes to talking about these issues publicly. So then when did we really start taking the idea of sex bots seriously? I think I think it would depend on who you ask. I think that it would depend on if you see now as being a, a very uh, prominent time for people to be discussing sex dolls. Are we really taking them uh, fully seriously in public discourse? Um, I think is a really interesting question. But I do think when we're talking about, you know, sex robots, when we were really started talking about, like, are we going to start seeing them uh, in, you know, people's homes kind of thing, in people's lives, was I think around 2017, 2018, when Harmony, you know, did this huge uh, public, uh, you know, interview uh, on all the major networks with Matt McMullen, uh, you know, ABC News is covering it. We've got the technology companies covering it. And I think that at that point, you start seeing a transition in where people are saying, okay, is this something that's actually going to have an effect on us as a society? What do we need to be doing uh, to kind of reduce any potential risk or uh, concerns about the technology and also the people that are using it. Uh, and I think that's when you start to see a huge uptick in research, in kind of dialogue, uh, in that capacity. I, I sort of get the impression, though, that the attention that was received then was more of a titillation thing. It was a, a giggle, get a load of this kind of thing. Absolutely. And I think that's very um, common with this kind of technology. I think that oftentimes, when you have a situation where one is a sex product, but it's also a sex product that is very salacious, it's taboo, it's something that people are sometimes off, often, you know, can be uncomfortable with it, especially because now it's not just a static, you know, image of a woman that you can uh, kind of say, oh, well, she's not connecting with you. In this case, she's really talking back. And how is that, you know, 
having those larger conversations about what it is to have a product that you are really conversing with on a human, you know, to machine level. Um, but I do oftentimes think that it is, oh, we're talking about this because, you know, it is a sexy thing to talk about. It is something that, you know, the news will pick up often to, you know, maybe stoke fears or just kind of talk about it in a way that will really interest audiences. Um, and I do think that that is something that is just the way that the sex technology industry will often be. But I also think that there's going to be a time, you know, in the next couple of years when you do see more robotic technology. And then at that point, uh, you know, more sophisticated movements and such, when you're going to say, oh, okay, are we actually talking about like a sex robot that has the capacity to really be what our imagination already takes them to be? So the talk today is focusing on treating sex dolls and sex robots as replacement companions, not just high tech masturbation devices, not just your blow up doll that you giggle about at the stag. Is this concept just marketing nonsense to make them more socially acceptable? It, it sort of feels like a variation of we don't call it marijuana anymore. We call it cannabis because that seems way more professional and serious and medical. Or is society actually evolving to look at this to fill an emotional and a psychological need? Yeah, I think in some ways it's both. I think that the companies themselves often position their products as companions to kind of remove that deviance from uh, the product. They're kind of trying to make it seem, you know, this isn't just something that people can have for sexual pleasure or that they're not really engaging with it on a higher level, but they're really becoming companions. And therefore you can make that argument of saying, we need to have this product for people who maybe don't have that human to human connection or as strong of connections, or they just really want someone to be in the house, you know, a variety of reasons. So I think that the corporations are very much into that kind of narrative to kind of, to give themselves that legitimacy. But on the other side, you see this research coming up where, you know, it's just starting, it's still limited, but it's growing in the way of how are the users responding to the product? How are they engaging with it? What's their future looking like when they say, you know, would you be interested in a sex robot product? Because a lot of the users are still sex doll uh, users. They don't have the robotic product because it is so uh, prohibitively expensive in many cases. So it's really understanding their perspective as well with the research. And, and what some research is finding is that there is that emotional connection. And there is something that is going beyond, oh, this is something I like, to really something that I'm engaging with on a emotional uh, and you know mental level. And I think that that is the kind of two part where the companies can go back to that research, go back to those specific users and say, like, are you benefiting from this and how can we better benefit you in that way? Well, talk to me then about the stigma component to this, because I remember back in the 90s, I had a friend who was doing online dating. We razzed him to the nth degree. Only losers are going on this thing called the Internet to try to find love. Now you fast forward 30 years, you've got Bumble, you've got Tinder, you've got Grindr, all of these online dating apps and algorithms, multi-million dollar companies targeting the non-geek side. But when you see an article you know, on the BBC about a guy who's got six real dolls in his house and he's sworn off women, I sort of feel like the general response is, well, there's something wrong with that guy. Yeah, there is a, a huge stigma when it comes to users who are using sex dolls, sex robots, whatever it may be. And I think that that is, it's a really interesting thing to unpack, right? So is this something that is going to develop like online dating where, you know, there's a Dr. Levi wrote a book back in, I think, 2007 postulating, are we going to have by like 2050 marriages with sex dolls, sex robots, and it will be normalized. We won't be saying, you know, having this kind of conversation of, oh, is there something wrong with them? Or, oh, is there something that needs to be fixed? It will just be, oh, you know, my friend is marrying their sex robot. And that's very normal. 
whether or not that comes to pass is still kind of developing. And I think that is uh, very dependent on how we are talking about it now. And I think that the way that we discuss the users, the way that we have uh, compassion and really understanding them from a research-based perspective uh, is super important. And I think that Obviously, you know, when you look back to the research of online dating, uh, you know, when it was that stigmatized thing of, oh, you're going online because you can't meet someone in person, you know, that felt made people feel a lot of shame uh, uh, and disheartened them in their way that they were choosing to, to find a relationship. And so I think that, you know, understanding how we discuss things now allows us to really think, okay, in the next 5, 10, 20 40, 50 years, is that going to be something that we are going to be okay with? And how are we going to uh, regulate that? And if, you know, if at all. Someone would argue, though, that it's silly to be concerned about the societal implications of sex bots when the days of walking, talking, sentient beings are so far into the future. Absolutely. I mean, when you think about the, you know, oftentimes we talk about Westworld and we say, oh, you know, how close are we to Westworld? Or is that the future uh, of robotics, especially when it comes to consciousness and sentience? Uh, and we are so far away uh, from that. The models now are just not to obviously that capacity. But I think what's really important about this time is that it is the basis of that future code. Right. So if you look at the foundations of the technology and the people that are creating that technology, there are in, there is interest uh, in really creating something more. And whether that be sentience or a form of sentience, I think that is why it's important to talk about it now is because there is inputting uh, code for advanced learning capabilities, which then could have the possibility to develop into a sentient or a robot that requires potentially rights or anything along those lines. So I think that now, obviously, we are, you know, many, many years away from that, but we are at that foundation where the technology is very new. It is in its infancy, and it really is developing uh, the way that we are creating it. So then, what is the present state of the art when it comes to sex bots? Masterson describes them as hyper-realistic, but that's really not the same as realistic. If our brains are our biggest organ, sexually speaking, it's still going to take a lot of imagination to believe we're interacting with a real person. And that's because of the uncanny valley, the term used to describe the graph of our acceptance of a human-like face. When a human-like figure is clearly not human, our brains are able to move past that lack of realism. But the closer we get to real, the more our brains fight back against what it is seeing. Getting to the other side of the uncanny valley and then back to acceptance will require more than 21st century vulcanized rubber. It will require the mimicking of micro expressions and involuntary actions like blinking. A human blink is only 100 to 400 milliseconds. Getting robotics to react with that speed is something we're having trouble doing today. Even a 500 millisecond blink will send our brains back down to the bottom of that uncanny valley. Yeah, so there are oftentimes models are very hyper realistic. So if you, you know, are on the internet and you're looking at uh, a sex uh, robot model or sex doll model, even uh, there are moments when you are, you know, glazing past your screen and it looks like a real person. And I think that a lot of the companies are, uh, in particular, Real Doll is very much into the art of creating something that is uh, beautiful. And even though they say they don't want to have something that's completely uh, you, that you couldn't differentiate between, you know, their product and a human, it looks very realistic. And I think that that comes from its origins of really making it an art form and trying to uh, create something that is as artistic as possible. And I think that once you start adding in those robotics, that artificial intelligence, that kind of technology is obviously, you know, very oriented around the specifics and the engineering, but it is an art itself. And it is uh, a, a way that you can form those 
you know, technology, those artistic, those, you know, different social things that we uh, automatically, you know, see as, oh, that's a, a beautiful person. You know, that is someone's impression that they are then importing onto uh, the product itself. So I think that there is ways in which the the product is a, a replication of what we see as an art and as what we see as beautiful right now. And I think that it uh, has developed in an interesting artistic way. Since the first one was introduced in 1996, what does it tell you today that the real doll offered robotic hip actuators, finger skeletons to replace the wire armatures, a computer-controlled speech feedback, only to abandon them because they were simply too expensive for the customer and the customer didn't buy them? Yeah, I think especially when you're talking about like the hip actuators and those kinds of, you know, the body sensors, the heat that uh, they have uh, tried to input into the systems, not just their robotics, but also their their doll components. Um, it's incredibly difficult. And I think that there is a, a risk of it becoming too, uh, like you said, problematic with financial reasons that can we afford uh, to do this on uh, even a you know micro scale, let alone a mass uh, production. But I think there's also that just the technology has not been there. Like the the idea of being able to move uh, the body at all is so complicated, and you're seeing only you know a few companies really be able to produce something that can walk and move. You know, you see Boston Dynamics with their smaller robotic uh, being able to do it, a dance or a flip. You know, that's something that's really complicated. But then if you think about that on a human scale, so something that's five, you know, five, five, you know, for a male robot, six feet tall, that's going to be a huge undertaking. So I think what, what they are saying, uh, from what I've understood from, you know, their discourse and such, it's really about how can we get to, uh, that place where the technology really meets the finances and how can we make it a place where, uh, each, uh, component is, uh, as effective as you, as possible, but also as financially uh, available to, to people. And I think that there will definitely be a time in which the body moves, the hips will be able to move, you know, there will be heating potentially sensors in that she'll be able to feel with, uh, you know, different kinds of um, tactile center sensors and such. So I definitely think that while those things are, still in development, quote unquote, it is potential uh, for the future. Absolutely. Yeah, I can imagine we're dealing with something as simple as the economies of scale. Once companies like Boston Dynamics have been able to develop a fleet, a squadron of these robots, the costs come down, the technology goes up, and then that becomes a consumer grade kind of thing. Kind of like how we talk about the spin-offs of NASA's research for sending man to the moon. Exactly. And I think it is kind of a, a race to see uh, who can get there the fastest and, and who can do it the best. I know that uh, Real Doll specifically has made uh, their own robotics uh, is their technology arm. And they are positioning themselves as not just, hey, you know, we make sex robots, but in reality, we're just making a really good robot, is one engineer has said. And, and I think they would have a lot of interest with taking their components that they are building and transferring that on a larger scale to different kinds of industries, such as, you know, the service industry when it comes to, you know, you go to a hotel and somebody is there checking you in. How can we make that be uh, a good experience for both the consumer uh, and the company? So I think that there's a lot of ways in which, you know, companies such as sex you know, sex robots, real doll, uh, can transfer their products potentially to a wider audience. The ratio of male to female sex dolls is overwhelmingly tilted towards male users and female dolls. Are women just waiting for more realistic replacements for men, or is a sex doll more of a guy thing? It's, it's a difficult question. I think that 
there obviously you have, you know, Real Doll has the heart, uh, Henry model. It has been developed in 2020. There was a, a short video clip of him uh, talking and he really had a lot more capabilities than his previous appearances in 2018 uh, or so. And I think that what we're seeing is uh, kind of that slower development with the male dolls because there's potentially not as much um, demand for them at this time. However, I do think that there is a lot of interest. And obviously, Matt McMullen has described that, that women have been interested in his product. Um, but I think what you're seeing is that it's one, there's a huge stigma for this product still. And so you have to kind of break that down too, is like, how do you make this a mass market product? Is it even possible to do so? Or will it always remain a niche? Uh, even in, if you do have, you know, women buying at a higher rate, is it still going to be a smaller uh, niche product? But you're also seeing just the physical capability. So each of these products weighs so much. So you're talking over a hundred pounds. Um, and if you're thinking, of different kinds of sexual capabilities, they're just quite not there yet. So the body's not moving. And so you're asking, you know, different kinds of people of different abilities, you know, physical abilities to kind of move these products and do different maneuvers with them. That's really difficult. So once you have those physical capabilities, will we then start to see differently able people or, you know, women involved, potentially, you know, uh, as a higher uh, market, that is a possibility. But will the stigma still remain and women won't want to be, you know, as involved in the product? It's hard to say. But I do think that component of uh, companionship is going to be really key when you're talking about how can we make this or do we want to make this something that more people would be interested in. Obviously, there's going to be a lot of women non-binary people, et cetera, that are going to be very interested in potentially having that, uh, you know, emotional connection. And I think that's where you'll see a wider market. The weight point's an interesting one. You have a 100-pound customer trying to lift a 100-pound sex doll. The, the manual is going to have to have an entire chapter dedicated to teaching you the firefighter method of lifting somebody. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a, the, the videos that they show, you know, oftentimes she, uh, you know, speaking of harmony, she's got like a bit of a hook on the back of her neck that she is lifted on. Oh, that's sexy. It's, it's not ideal <laughs> when you think about it. Uh, obviously, you know, looking to Westworld and those other kinds of science fiction depictions, they don't often have uh, the hook in the back of the neck, but, you know, as she does not physically stand up herself, she doesn't have uh, that really uh, strong legs, so to say, with that uh, those physical and technological capabilities. You know, she is hooked onto a, a, you know a large uh, metal pole, or can be, or obviously sitting down, and so that's a huge weight lift. You know, you're kind of bench pressing a significant uh, weight, and I think that that's just kind of the standard of. The product right now, and obviously as you know, the materials develop, the silicone may be lighter, the you know skeleton itself may get lighter. Um, and I think also when she starts to move or he starts to move, uh, you'll see a bit of a difference there. Tell me what your presentation to the International Communication Association Conference in 2021 uh, said, and the the so-called Scott analysis of Real Doll and Real Botics. First, what is a Scott analysis? So Scott is the uh, social construction of technology theory. So it basically says, instead of thinking of technological determinism, where the technology, you know, affects us and we have no or little control, it's more about the cyclical process. So, you know, you have the, the you know, technology over here and you've got the people over here and it's, it's going back and forth. How can we make sure that the design is something that the users want, but it were, you know, it's working technologically. And so that kind of cycle uh, is how I approached uh, McMullen's discourse uh, with him understanding his role as a creator and what he really wants uh, for his product, his legacy. That's something that he often thinks about is not just right now, but, you know, in the next 
30 you know, plus years, what are people going to say when they look back to Real Doll and they look back to my creation? And what can I do to kind of facilitate that narrative in the best way possible? And I think that oftentimes it is an exciting venture to, to think about uh, that, again, sentience of a robot is, is that something that, you know, he wants to be creating? And what would that show for uh, the future of the technology? Um, but really understanding how the audience, how the users are really uh, affecting the technological design. And I think that becomes really important when you think about the hyper-realism of the product currently, you know, as users start to give feedback, as audiences do, as non-users do, you know, how are we going to develop uh, this really hyper-realistic, uh, obviously very feminized form at this time? You keep using the term hyper-realistic, but at the end of the day, to your point, you might be flipping past a bunch of videos out of the corner of your eye, it looks like a real human, but then when you get up close to it, whether it's a video or a person, your brain is gonna be screaming. This is the uncanny valley that's really holding back the actual acceptance of sex bots. It's definitely a theory that I think is prominent. I think when you look at uh, any of the models and they look really, really realistic, but immediately again, when they start to talk, you can hear you know, that eerie sound or uh, it just doesn't feel right. Um, and I think that that is definitely something that designers are very concerned about. I think when it comes back to that sociological perspective, are we looking to the uncanny valley and really saying, okay, how do we either not get there or do we need to go past it? What does that, you know, those boundaries uh, really rectify? Because I think that the visuals and the obviously the way that they talk and what they talk about uh, is is something that is really being negotiated right now as to make people more comfortable with them and more comfortable with artificial intelligence and robotics in general. So there are two major hurdles that need to be overcome for sex bots to be a real thing in the future. The first is technology. The other is intellectual. One of the biggest issues, of course, is artificial intelligence. Modern day chatbots suffer from the intellectual equivalent of the uncanny valley. Big advances have been made since the 1980s when the Eliza chatbot did little more than parrot back what we told it. But why do we care if our sex bot can carry on a conversation? Raspberry Dream Labs in 2020 was quoted as saying, there are quiet people who are looking for some kind of companionship and have not been able to find it with human beings. That companionship is not just about physical, it's about an emotional connection. And that emotional connection is created when you either have something in common or you appreciate the personality of the other individual. Absolutely. And and that quote, you know, from Matt, uh, Matt McMullen, really understanding, like, this is who my audience is. These are who the users are. I think the artificial intelligence is obviously developing. It's not to the level of Apple Siri, of Watson, you know, these big... Uh, companies that have been working on this artif artificial intelligence for so long, I think what is an interesting dynamic is that with the companies right now, you're running it through a mobile application and you're creating the personality as a user. So you input certain features that you want your uh, robot to really act like. So you know, very intellectual, you want her to be funny, uh, you know, you can bump those things up like you could another kind of uh, interface of a personal companion. And I think that that is still the basic format of what it is right now. Uh, in some ways, I think that memory component of not parroting it back, but saying, you know, hey, I remembered yesterday you said you really liked this book. Uh, you know, did you know the author is coming out with another book? I think that's the kind of emotional connection uh, that would be next level. And that would be something that you start to see that really strong emotional connection, that mental connection uh, with the robot. And I think right now, uh, you know, obviously the access is not there, but it is strongly developing. And those learning capabilities of saying, okay, you know, you said this, this one time now, you know, as the AI, you need to learn these three kinds of 
uh, you know, spreads uh, into the different mindsets of, of you know, responses. And so I think that that is the next step. But obviously, as any artificial intelligence engineer could tell you, that's incredibly difficult to really mimic a, per- a person. Well, one of the biggest issues with AI is bias, and we have to think about artificial intelligence research right now. STEM, generally, it's overwhelmingly male. We still have to put a tremendous amount of effort to get young women into that field just generally, let alone within the realm of sex bots. A female AI designed by men may only produce female sex dolls that interact in a masculine sort of fashion. Do we have a sense that the sex bot industry understands the issues of bias? I think that they are aware of it. I think that there is a, especially when pushed publicly, you know, through different interviews saying, you know, you are a man creating a female robot for oftentimes men. What does that mean? And what are the implications for that? How do you know that you're creating a fully, uh, you know, formed idea of a woman. And even still, you know, when we think about Hollywood, the writer's rooms, are there women in there creating these characters that are fully formed and have their own interests and personality types? Whether or not the sex robot industry really is making efforts to introduce women and other uh, gender identities, other sexual identities, is a little unclear. Uh, for the Realbot team, I think at this point publicly, they only have uh, one woman on staff, uh, but that is someone who is also on a lot of the patents that they are creating. So what is that dynamic there? It's unknown. But I do think that there is an understanding that you can't just create a robot that is only for this one populace and you're not addressing an entire Uh, other kind of person, but you're also not addressing like the complexities of what artificial intelligence, particular uh, a woman uh, as an artificial intelligence could be. So whether or not they're aware of it, they're doing it unclear, but I do think that's obviously something that uh, should be addressed and, and pushed for. While we've been focused on the state of the art of sex bot technology, how it will evolve and who wants one, there's a bigger picture question that isn't getting much attention from the nightly news reporters tittering about the tech. How do we address the social implications of sex bots in society? When our digital sex partner doesn't have agency over itself, are we not at risk of dehumanizing actual sex partners? Is it okay to brutalize a robot? And if we do, do those actions make it more likely we'll do the same to real people? For Masterson, the answer requires more research. Yeah, I think it's a really difficult question. I think that the answer is often research. I think that we need to understand what the relationship is, both you know, as a correlation, but also as a causation. Are we introducing this product and that's causing... Uh, a difficult or adverse reaction? Are people becoming either too dependent, which some research has postulated as a, a problem? Are they going to have, you know, increased violence against women? Are there going to be, you know, different kinds of uh, abuse components to it? And the initial research that is still limited but is rapidly growing is kind of indicating that there isn't this potential link that you're seeing a sex doll uh, user is not necessarily having an increase in violence against women, and in some cases are identifying uh, women as more unknowable, which may indicate why you're going to the sex doll versus maybe having a relationship with a human. And I think that it's more about understanding, okay, are users going to have a higher reaction or increased violence than a non-user? And what's that relationship really going to look like? And what kind of research can we uh, you know, create to really understand that? Because the dehumanization component is a really tough thing to test for. How do you test that someone is you know, dehumanizing someone? So there are other factors 
you know, that media affects people, uh, you know, and I leave that to, to them in all their glory uh, to really understand that component, because I think that's a really uh, important discussion and important argument to really understand what that uh, is looking like now and what it could look like in the future. You had a really great quote from the San Diego Tribune on agency and robotic rights. Should my toaster be able to refuse to toast my bread? Yeah, another uh, Matt McMullen uh, describing, I think, when pushed on that, hey, you're creating a being that maybe doesn't have right that agency, that control, uh, that choice. And, you know, the responding of, well, should my toaster have that choice is a false equivalency, obviously. It's not something uh, your toaster is not a humanoid form. It's not having an emotional connection with people, at least not yet, obviously. And so I think what, uh, you know, you're seeing is that that pushback of saying, you know, I am creating a machine. I'm not creating a human. I'm not creating a being that needs to go beyond uh, what a normal technology needs to have. The complexity of that is that you're creating an artificial intelligence and like all artificial intelligence should be kind of looked at and are we needing to regulate that in, in what capacity and what does that need to look like when it comes to the privacy of users, you know, the, the kind of complexities that they can, the, the artificial intelligence can create, you know, develop into uh, and what that says uh, about the future of machine, robotics, and humans in that relationship. So I think that it's an interesting dynamic of, of how are we discussing and how are we creating uh, this kind of technology. Here's another quote for you. Uh, it's uh, Jurassic Park's Ian Malcolm. Your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. Thoughts? I, <laughs> I just rewatched this film. So it is also top of mind for me. And I think what's interesting uh, with that is that so with the scientists on the academic side, what you're seeing is a lot of questioning. A lot of theoretical work is being produced on how are we creating these? How are we being ethical? Uh, you know, should we be creating more robotic, less humanoid styles in general? You know, should we have that kind of feminist spin on it? How can we develop that? And so I think what we're seeing is a lot of questioning from academia in that capacity. When it comes to scientists, like the engineers, the people that are creating it, I think there's a lot of excitement and joy. I think there's a lot of saying, uh, we want to create this and develop this uh, to see what it could become. And I think that comes from also a place of we don't necessarily want to be regulated um, and we don't want to have those restrictions put on us. And I think that uh, is a really difficult uh, connection. So uh, to say, you know, a corporation can't be regulated, um, that's not something that we've seen, you know, throughout, you know, big tech as being an effective thing for the consumer, for the user, for society. And so I think when we're seeing, you know, those scientists questioning, you know, should we be doing this and are we doing this in the best way possible? It also needs to be a relationship with the corporate side saying, you know, yes, we want you to be ethical about this, but we want to make sure that it's bounded or, uh, you know, created in a way that is going to be the best for all parties involved. And I think that that's normal for any kind of technology and even more important when we're talking about one that looks like, like us, like people. Annette, thank you so much for your time and insight. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Annette Masterson is a PhD student at Temple University in Philadelphia. With advances in artificial intelligence, we may be less than 10 years away from that 2014 Spike Jones film, Her, about the lonely man falling in love with Samantha, the voice of his computer. But putting Samantha in a body that leaps the uncanny valley and into our homes is still about 20 years away. And if economics teaches us anything about scale, it could be 2050 before the cost of a virtual companion falls enough to be something the average loner could afford. That gives us time to establish society's own Isaac Asimov's three laws of sex robotics 
and research the effects that replacing human companionship with a machine will have on our views of sexuality and each other. At Where'sMyJetpack.ca, Amber Healy delves into the current state of research into the societal and emotional implications of sex bots. She asks, when a person's sexual partner is a computer in a silicon body made to individual specifications and fantasies incapable of resisting or turning down advances, does that open the door for violent urges to be brought to the forefront? For the answer to that question, as science knows it today, click the link in the description. And be sure to subscribe on YouTube, Twitter, and wherever you get your podcasts today. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us in the future. Where's My Jetpack is not available in all timelines. Watch Where's My Jetpack on YouTube or subscribe wherever fine podcasts are found. A special thanks to the Digital Life Institute at the Ontario Tech University for connecting us to Annette Masterson at the Institute's sister institution, Temple University. For more research, visit digitallife.org. And join us in the future at where'smyjetpack.ca and on social media at myjetpackca.